Texas Lutheran University. First of all, all of you remember Dr. John McCluskey. He's an assistant vice president. We won't say he's gone over the dark side, but he was a chemistry student here and uh, was a uh, chemistry department chair for many years. And he's going to give a brief welcome from the administration. He's part of the plan. <laughs> it's always nice when walking in front and I get an applause. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you will. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> uh, good to see all of you here. Um, some of you I know have uh, traveled some good distance and maybe some good time since you've last been here. It's good to see you all here. Um, and uh, certainly enjoy remembering all the great experiences we've had here. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, only look like you might be a bit older than I am. I tell students I was here 475 years ago. I won't say what that means for a few of you, uh, Dr. Wasman, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to see everyone here, and uh, hope you have a great time. I'm going to be introducing in order uh, biology, chemistry, and physics because we're going to do it alphabetically. And so I'd like to introduce uh, the department chair of biology, Dr. Al Lee. She's been here approximately 15 or 20 375. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to uh, have Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is unique. He was a uh, pediatric uh, infectious disease doctor for many years, an MD, and then he uh, got a PhD in botany. And so he is a scholar and academician, and he's our current department chair, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Squire, for that nice introduction. Yes, I, I am the department chair right now, it's Dr. Alan Levis, and it's been since 1998. I've been here, and uh, so I don't know whether it's 18 years now, but it's 18 years. Um, Biology. Biology. <laughs> but it's, it's been a good 18 years. This is a great place to be. And I want to welcome everybody here from uh, from the biology department standpoint. It's good to have uh, you folks here. I see a number of graduates roaming around the, the hall. And I will have the opportunity to introduce uh, folks in my department uh, to you so they can talk a little bit about, uh, about themselves. Um, I do want to introduce Mrs. Dean in the back, who's the uh, secretary in the building. And that uh, keeps us uh, all going here in the building. And, and then with regard to uh, biology itself, I do want to acknowledge that we have a former faculty member uh, sitting in the back, Mr. Earth Patterson, is uh, sitting at the far back. <laughs>
so I think with that introduction, I'm going to keep moving down the line and introduce my next colleague, Dr. Danielle Grove.
quite involved experiment right at the end where we looked at estradiol in this group over here in kind of this greenish color. And then we looked at BPA in this kind of bluish color over here. And what we found was that, and I know it's a lot of bars, but if you look at the control and you say the control is somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3, all right, you're looking to see if anything goes above that control level. And so what you find is that there is a dosage of estradiol and there is a dosage of BPA, which is quite a bit higher than the control level. Now, like I said, this is a preliminary experiment. We've really only done this one time. I hesitated to show this at all because usually you don't show data unless you've done it at least a couple times. Um, but I figured this is a friendly audience and you're kind of curious about what we accomplished this summer. And so this is what we managed to accomplish. And what I think is kind of surprising, at least to me, was that this 10 to the minus 17th molar is the lowest dose we treated with, and we thought that that was not going to have much of an effect. Um, so we could probably go even lower next summer to see what kinds of effects we would see. Um, we did find an unusual timing issue with our control treatment that you also see in the estradiol treatments. So we've got to work out some of our our timing issues and our treatment issues as well. But you know, at least we were able to treat cells with BPA. This is the first summer that we've actually uh, managed to do that. And that was, that was what we managed to accomplish. So again, you know, the kinds of things I'll be looking at are dosage mechanism, looking at neurons, that's the goal for next summer. And then down the road, looking at other kinds of environmental estrogens, because there's no shortage of those. And I just want to thank um, my funding sources, and then some of the people that also were around this summer, Jeremy Coden and Dr. Kraz, as well as Ari, like I said, who did most of the work with me. Um, we all kind of worked as a team at different times in the summer. Thank you.
for about 200 days or so. So you figure in bacteria, uh, they take about an hour maybe for, for uh, generation time. So, so in, in, a, in a 24 hour period, they probably go through 18 or 20 generations. So uh, over 200 days, this is a significant uh, number of generations. So we have all these different cultures and we'd expect perhaps that they would diverge over time. So this is kind of a, um, a model of, of um, allopatric speciation, more or less, right? So, so these have been separated genetically, they don't mix anymore, and who knows what mutations they might accumulate in, in the different strains. So, uh, so Danny was working this summer and uh, he was characterizing these four strains and seeing how they may have changed one versus another. And so he was he, he did a lot of work growing these guys up in uh, in different types of, of media, testing how they grow. We didn't grow them on glucose, we grow them on our complex nutrient broth, which is mostly amino acids. And so he tested whether they grew well in glucose or in uh, some other sugars, right? So uh, because they weren't selected for that at all, they might have lost ability to, to metabolize some of these other sugars. So he's got a poster up in the ASC, so you know, wander over there and look at the poster if you want more details. Um, and then, then also he was cloning chromosome, chromosomal DNA from the four strains because we also want to ask the question, well, if they have diverged, how did they diverge? So one way we could do that would be to, uh, to clone pieces of DNA, sequence those pieces, and then compare them to the, to the sequences in the database from, from wild type bacillus. And so he did that. Uh, we, we, we always encounter problems, uh, you know, that's the nature of research. And so we didn't get very far with this. We sent out a few clones, and one of them came back uh, with a identifiable gene. And uh, you can see that also is in his poster. It was about 85% similar. So, I mean, probably that's mostly due to, to sequencing errors and things like that, plasma purity and things like that. But, so I didn't think they converged 50% over uh, uh, 400 passages, 200 passages. But anyway, um, preliminary data, as, as, as was mentioned before. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the major project that we work on this summer. We also had a top secret project that, that was thrown our way, uh, <laughs> characterizing bacteria that were found in some kind of industrial fluid. And so that was kind of fun as a side thing. We, uh, we got this industrial fluid that was contaminated and it smelled bad, and so it must be bacterial, right? So, so we, we were tasked with the uh, with identifying the bacteria that grew in this, in this fluid. So we did that too. We found four different types of bacteria. Again, by DNA sequencing, we just isolated the uh, small ribosomal RNAs from these bacteria, sent them off, and, and the answer came back. We had one bacillus, no, two bacilluses, uh, one pseudomonas, and one uh, enterococcus. So, uh, so it, was, it, was, it was a good summer. Um, as I said, uh, go look at the poster. <laughs>
what my dissertation was on and what I, I still am very interested in is what we call the bone marrow microenvironment. Um, which are the commission of cells that actually influence um, the production of blood cells. And um, they're located in the bone marrow and they have been uh, uh, directly linked with the development of a certain um, syndrome called myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, and myelodysplastic syndrome, I'll talk about in just a little bit, but it is a, a blood disorder and affects your blood cell production. And cells in the bone marrow have been shown to influence the development of MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome. And I love this phrase because I've always um, studied the environment and we should know that we are a product of our environment, even though we were sometimes we were not. Right? Um, so just a little bit about it so you have an idea. Um, MDS is actually a stem cell disorder where the special type of stem cell called the hemopoietic stem cell can't develop the appropriate numbers of blood cells anymore. And so you, uh, what ends up happening is there's not enough immune cells out there to combat infections or to transport oxygen around in case of red blood cells. And so there's just insufficient number of mature cells. Um, the development of myelodysplastic syndrome has actually been linked to benzene exposure. Does anybody know where you actually can get benzene Change the 
morph. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't change the, seem to change the morphology. And down here at the bottom, with the highest doses, you see these curled up cells. These are all dead cells. They're apoptotic, or we assume they're apoptotic. Um, and then as we get closer towards somewhere in the middle, sometimes we'd see a morphology change, and then sometimes we wouldn't. It was very odd. Sometimes we didn't see it. And so what we wanted to do in our next experiment was take some of these doses where we saw this increased proliferation, but not a dramatic change on the morphology. This is dead, there's no point in doing anything with this anymore. Um, and then, of course, we had our always our length or zero. And we wanted to see if we treated the, these S17 cells and put bone marrow cells on top of them, which they're supposed to be able to support, would they not be able to support bone marrow cells anymore? <coughs> So we had to uh, uh, take our stroma cells, S17 cells, we treated them with hydroplanum, rinsed our cells many, many times, and then cold cultured them with bone marrow cells on top. And what you can see here is these are our different doses, zero, which is our normal control, and then two other doses that we chose to use. And uh, the readout here is the number of colonies. Whenever you put bone marrow cells, on F17 cells normally, they should start to form these little clusters we call colonies. And we would expect to see a certain number uh, standard. Right? And then whenever we treated them, we could actually see that they declined. Now, this is just one experiment, but I wanted to show you a little bit of what we're going to um, repeat next semester, or next summer. Um, and so we're looking into doing these and repeating them again, and also using other types of cell lines and other types of chemicals. Poster in the AFC.
but uh, and, and it's, it's because we get such wonderful students and such wonderful alumni here. Our students uh, at Texas Lutheran, as you well know, you come to work. You get a lot of homework. You get 400 questions on a, on a lab practical. <laughs> and you have such senior faculty. Uh, the first year I got here, I was interviewed by Dr. Preston Reeve. And I had done my dissertation at Baylor College of Medicine on subfractions of uh, low density lipoprotein, ApoA1 and ApoB. And so I gave my seminar here, uh, figuring that no one would really know what I was talking about was I wrong. <laughs> and so uh, I think Dr. Reeves questioned me for about 15 straight minutes on the substructure of apple lipoprotein A1 and B, and I didn't know that there were two other subfractions of apple B. Okay, so when I first got here, Dr. Reeves signed up for my first general physiology class. <laughs> <laughs> and he took it for a grade. Oh! So, I, what did he get? <laughs> what do you think he got? <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> so I'm writing notes by physiology. We're talking about the autonomic nervous system, and free ganglionic fibers, and the drugs of the uh, catecholamines of the pyramidal What are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Epinephrine, okay. norepinephrine, dopamine. So I'm drawing the structures up there, and Dr. Reeves raised his hand, and he says, can I hold the chart there? I had the structure so completely wrong. I have this right now. Thank you, Dr. Reeves. But that's the kind of a building we are. We're kind of in a symbiotic relationship of friends and colleagues for the benefit of your students. Uh, Dr. Reeves was the lead author uh, on a grant that Dr. Wasden, myself, and Dr. Jonas was on that built the uh, Crow Center. It was called Synergism in Science. Well, we had a dream that biology, physics, and chemistry would be in close approximation to work together to bring these prerequisite skills up. And I think it's worked out pretty, pretty well since we got that grant. And uh, it was uh, 550,000 or something like that. Uh, close enough like that. So that's the Crow's building that, uh, what? Fireman. Fireman. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Muscle made us 200 pounds. <laughs> so, anyway, I'd like to next introduce keeping us on schedule is uh, Dr. Bill Davis, the Chair of Chemistry. <laughs> so, no PowerPoints to be here. Uh, just like to welcome everybody, and, and also we, we beat biology because we have two Americans. <laughs> Dr. Reed and Dr. Wasman. Although using Emeritus with Wasman is a little you gotta be careful. I'm I'm actually originally from Canada. Go oh, boots. <laughs> and, uh, did, did all of my uh, my schooling in, in Canada at the university you've probably never heard of. And, uh, came to Texas in 1998. Uh, started at uh, TLU in 2008. Uh, what is it? You, you weren't born in Texas, but you got here as fast as you could. Right? That's, <laughs> I was originally, tra I'm trained as a quantum chemist, but I've sort of morphed into a general physical and analytical chemist over the course of my career. So I teach all of the courses that people that don't like math don't like to take. <laughs> so, so I've kind of been there. Uh, summer research, what I've been really doing since I've been here is, is uh, looking at toxic heavy metals in consumer materials. We've done things like uh, toys made in China, which I would suggest you don't buy your younger children. <laughs> Uh, uh, mercury and skin whitening creams, uh, mercury and, and arsenic and brown rice sweetened uh, cereals that are usually fed to children. Uh, and one we've got this summer that we have a poster, everybody keeps saying poster, but we have a poster in the ASC. It's Allie Goyer and Chad Lake, we don't know Chad's here, but uh, they're the ones that work with me this summer. Is uh, uh, again, toxic heavy metals in uh, makeup. Okay. So all that we get to basically use and abuse and break the instrument. We try. They break it. They break it. Uh, yeah, let me now introduce uh, in alphabetical order of Dr. Allison Gray.
places I never thought I'd end up. So I'm surely an analytical, instrumental type person. I try to keep the instruments running. It breaks the music. It breaks the music. Um, so I spent the summer working with USDA at the ARS labs in Houston, Agricultural Research Science Group in um, Houston. And so we now have a really cool project. If you want to go out and see it, we don't have a poster because when you work with plants, you have to wait for plants to grow. <laughs> and especially if you take said plants and poison them with arsenic. <laughs> so we have a project where we are looking as a, kind of a, as an outgrowth of the finding a lot of arsenic in rice-based foods. Is there a way that we can adjust how we grow rice to minimize the amount of arsenic that is taken up by the rice plants? So arsenic in general is just hanging up in the soil. A lot of it's just natural actually frame from weathering the sulfide mineral. Some of it was used back in the day for um, herbicides and pesticides. We try not to do that anymore. That's a bad idea. It doesn't really go away. It will just sit there until you decide to put a rice field on it and you flood the rice field. When you flood the rice field, everything goes anoxic. And suddenly arsenic is arsenic on the move. And arsenic on the move will end up in your plants. It ends up in your plants, it ends up in your rice, and then it ends up on your table. So, should you stop eating rice? No, just keep going. We don't need enough rice in the U.S. to really be worried about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what we're trying to do as a greenhouse is we have a whole, we, we build ourselves a rice field. So I'm working with Ray Johnson and Paul Pollock, and where's Chad? Chad. He's crying after the beat. Somewhere, somewhere out there is Chad. So they have been very dedicated working out in the greenhouse. We, we built ourselves a rice field growing in, in pots up there. I don't know how many, like 140 pots of rice grain. And we poison them all with arsenic. We're trying to flood them at certain times in their growth and unflood them at other times to see if we, if we hit the right time, can we minimize how much arsenic is actually ending up in the rice itself. That said, we think we may have stunted them a little bit, but we, we got them some lights and they're making a comeback. So we're doing studies of actual plant tissue, grinding the tissue, dissolving the tissue. So this, this is where we forget the biology and actually just go do the chemistry part. Let's dissolve all the rice. And then we're doing soil extracts and, and water chemistry. And that's what we're doing. We don't have a poster yet, but if you'd love to come out and talk to the rice and cheer it on. Come on up to the greenhouse and you'll be happy. So we're going in alphabetical order. So after B comes R. Uh, when you react it and turn it into a compound, looks like this. 
Um, let's see. Then there's the. Uh, I should have brought my slides. One day you have to. This is called we're making up as it goes to leave. Uh, <laughs> designing the compound and sort of fine-tuning the parts to try to make this effective as possible. And uh, this particular group, the ice tin, that's what we're working on. We think the T-butyl is the best thing, the T-butyl uh, phenyl group right here, it's the best thing to, to affect the change in this compound. And over here, we're now uh, making changes to this one. And we're sending these compounds off to the end sky for testing. Now, what this does, why I say it was interesting, is uh, anybody familiar with the box from Muhammad Ali? Nobody, okay, and forget that one. <laughs> Muhammad Ali, one of the most famous band, uh, boxers in all time, uh, he made this uh, boxing technique called the rope a And what he did is he would bounce up against the ropes and try to dodge and lean back and forth. The other boxer would wear himself out trying to beat up Muhammad Ali while he was just absorbing all that energy. Then later in the fight, he would come back and, and not get a uh, boxer out, called rope a Same type of thing here with the chemistry. What we're doing is, the yeah, first pass chemotherapy comes through, okay? Then the, the cancer comes back, and it's like, all right, we're, you know, you knock us down first with that chemotherapy, we're coming back. Well, that was, that was the first part. Now the second part is the robot where we come in and we throw this stuff at you. And what that does is that uses something called collateral seven sensitivity. What collateral sensitivity is, is as this thing starts expressing the peak lipoprotein, it becomes sensitive, more sensitive to compounds of this nature. So what's interesting is that once you get the cancer, if it, if it comes back, if you go into, if you go into remission, then, then it relapses, the uh, peak lipoprotein cells will come back into this uh, cancer cell and actually be more effective at killing these things. And once that cancer expresses the peak lipoprotein, it is fully, se fully sensitive to these compounds, which means that it's not coming back. So this is like the one-two punch. You know, I'll give you a little jab, and then you come back at me, then I give you the upper pen, and then you're out. So this is why it's exciting, is that this thing really has a lot of potential um, for uh, uh, anti-cancer use. Uh, another thing that I'm doing, not so much with students, but we're uh, starting to uh, work with some educational techniques in the classroom. I don't know how many people have heard of inverted classroom, but that means I get to strip my ego even more and actually post videos of myself teaching on YouTube <laughs> and give it to the students. The students watch the videos and then they come to class and we work problems. And uh, this has shown a, a, a lot of promise with the students, and then the students love it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so they get the they get experience with lame jokes over and over and over again. You can just watch it again. Oh, that was funny. Uh, look, he's talking like a pirate again. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Thanks for coming down again at the ANC. Please check out our poster. It's exciting research, and thanks for coming. Right here, Dr. Dorsey, the thing. 
the audience and myself had to survive through that first year of organic chemistry, but Dr. Markowski really taught us what it was to really have work ethic when it comes to chemistry, to really try hard, to really think about problems at a very high level, and I think that really got me hooked into chemistry. So thank you to all those good people, and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Toledo. I have a uh, bachelor's in TLU in 2004. Um, Wasman and all the people in the chemistry department told me, Biology, that's evil. Never take any biology classes. <laughs> and don't take any of that. So I got to grad school with that mentality, and I realized that most of the funding out of the grad school program was actually coming from Bio Fire type projects. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's not so good. And I'm looking around, and for me to get those skills, I actually had to go and engage in a lot of training in biology. So I ended up getting a PhD in bioorganic chemistry, working in modeling some metal enzymes, iron metal enzymes during my work over there. That was a, a lot of fun, and I really, really enjoyed it. I was fortunate enough that um, upon retirement of Dr. Wiseman, uh, I was privileged to come back and to actually take his spot as an inorganic chemistry at TLU. I've been here for six years. Um, my research involves, I moved down the periodic table a little bit, so I worked with a nickel metallo enzyme. It's one of the 10 known metallo enzymes that are in nature, so we're really excited about working with a selected group of enzymes. We're interested in understanding the mechanism and reactivity of these enzymes and how they actually work by building small molecule mimics of those enzymes. So we're trying to build a family of molecules that actually look just like the enzyme and figure out if the reactivity actually matches it really well. This is work inspired from uh, work for the University of Utah by uh, Lisa Barrow. So it's, it's actually a lot of fun. In the six years, five years, I guess, five summers that I've had here at TLU, I've had the pressure of uh, mentoring uh, now 13 undergraduate students. So. A lot, of, a lot of really good students with me, and I think I Daniela Capurro is here, Vanessa Espinosa, they were the, lead, the most recent people that worked with me, they did a lot of good work. But we couldn't quite get a crystal structure of that compound that we were looking for, so we don't have a poster for that, but we will be hopefully at the regional ATS meeting pretty soon. Uh, they work really hard. Uh, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, yeah, so we are we are very excited at TLU to have introduced a new biochemistry degree, the biochemistry degree was introduced this is the first year. We'll have a first crop of graduates coming out in next year, I guess. They're juniors now, so they're coming down. Uh, that's something that Dr. Jonas and I collaborated with, and the both departments decided that it's something that we wanted to strengthen our departments with, so we put together that program. We're very excited about it. We have 17 majors total right now, I think, completely enrolled in the department in that, in that program, so that's very exciting for us. Um, we would we'll love to have you if you're a student here, just in that kind of thing. We'd love to have you support. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I think that's it. That's the most important. Yeah, take some biology here. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, uh, the next senior most uh, member of the department uh, joined in uh, fall of 2013. Uh, Dr. Jerry Carr did a PhD in plasma physics at West Virginia University and uh, his undergraduate work was at uh, Georgia Tech. And actually, uh, I'll, I'll let you say a couple of things. We, he was here for one year and did actually get some students involved in some research last summer, so I just want you to yeah, say Appreciate that. that. So, great to actually be here and talk to you all a little bit about it. I'm a plasma physicist by training, so I study things basically like the fourth state of matter, the, the stars, the most populous known form of matter in the universe. Yes, there's dark matter, but we don't understand it as well. Plasma <laughs> is where it's at as far as I'm concerned. And we like it because you can do so many things with it. Obviously, you can study like the way the sun works and maybe how to bring that energy source down here, that fusion. You can study how to make better chips to make it so you have iPhones or whatever the heck the Samsung device is <laughs> in my hand. Um, so you can do everything. You can um, go over the place. We had a great opportunity here at TLU to start two collaborations. I'm really excited about this because one of the collaborations is with, is with the Department of Energy. There's a national laboratory called Oak Ridge National Lab. Depending upon you as there, where the Manhattan Project, um, you know, went, went ahead and came across and they built bombs. They also did that at Los Alamos too, so you got a little, little competition between the two. But our student went over there and um, got to work with a plasma device that helps generate the plasma needed for the linear accelerator. So it's a $1.4 billion science project, but TLU's name is right there. So we were really excited about that. So that's one poster you can see tomorrow, and we got pictures there too. Another poster you're gonna to see tomorrow is actually, I had two students actually stay here locally, kind of. Well, okay, so they work with the Southwest Research Institute, and they work with twin satellite data. So Southwest Research Institute is right in San Antonio, right up the street, we got a new collaboration with them. They want to work with us, and it's very exciting. But we're kind of studying things that are everywhere from like 20 Earth radius away, so I can't really call it local, local. But it's still, it's the magnetosphere of the Earth. You know, we're studying how plasma storms are coming in, and just trying to understand that weather pattern. So uh, please come on by to our posters. We'd love to show you more pictures and things like that. And hey, good to meet y'all. So I have, uh, before you, uh, yes, uh, we have one other uh, faculty member, and I think he had to step out, uh, Dr. Calvin Berger, and he is a visiting assistant professor this year, uh, did his PhD at UC Berkeley, and is a Texan from Texas A&M uh, for his undergraduate. So I'm really excited. Uh, the physics department is on its way um, up. Um, so if you're if you get tired of that biology and chemistry, <laughs> they save the best for last. It has nothing to do with alphabetic form. We also like we also like working with the other people. Yeah, we do. plasma. I'm GD. Yes. Or me. Or you. We're here, right? Off those <laughs> Stay on schedule so we can go about five minutes to the speech if we can take that. Uh, Claire, pick up first. So I, well you're third on you, you wanted to be first, okay. She's the boss, she runs the department. Where all 
money came from. Um, and it was actually his idea to start this project and with the funding and everything else, so we are very grateful. This is the field. We went out from about 8 in the morning to noon, uh, depending on how the kind of perspective you can spell. <laughs> and um, in this picture, some students are collecting plant samples. So basically, we would go out and either use our little clippers or our little digging tool and press them in the field so that we could bring them back and dry them. And oh, that's us. This was uh, me and then she and Adam this summer. Um, these are just some more pictures of places that we went. Um, these are some of the plants that we collected at the time. Sorry, I'm just trying to go back. I'm not to go um, The snow on the ferry, which is actually really beautiful in the field. And then the blue bell. Um, this summer, we had the privilege of, I think, actually, a um, couple summers in a row now, of going to UT Austin's herbarium. A lot of our samples go there when we get people kids so that they can put it into their um, records as well. And so this is when we were visiting them. Um, and they were just showing us some of their samples that they have. They have samples from like Malaysia and things like that. We stay in Guadalupe County for the most part. Um, and so it was just really exciting. We got to tour their entire herbarium. Um, um, and so it was just a really great learning opportunity for us to go from our two cabinets of herbarium to their like 10 floors of herbarium. Um, so that was really cool. Also, we are doing books, or I guess the Western Ranch Project is doing books. Um, the lichens of the Western Ranch is actually Dr. Hughes' project with um, Dr. Tucker, and it's this one right here. Um, it's actually off the right now, which is very, very um, interesting. And then the one that the students have been working on with Dr. Leavis and Dr. Gustafson is the plants of Washington Ranch. Um, and I, in progress, I actually saw a draft of it this summer. It's pretty amazing. Um, and this is just more of the pictures of Long County. We um, focused on West Ranch, but we also went to Dr. Christensen's ranch and Dr. Lee's ranch as well.
National Library of Medicine, and um, those, those are my main search, so I'm going to search for something. So my project focused on this protein called blob, and it binds to nascent polymerase gluey transcripts. Um, and they figured out um, its primary function in yeast, but they were moving on to um, organisms like mice, and they tried to create knockout models to see the function of law in these type of organisms, but um, the organisms didn't develop past a certain stage in development. So then the next step would be to create selective knockouts. Um, so uh, that's where my project kind of tagged on to with these selective knockouts. And um, they knocked out um, this law protein in KMK2 alpha from the, uh, KMK2 alpha neurons. So these are primarily excitatory neurons in the cortex and hippocampus. And so they saw that in these knockouts there was an upregulation in immune response uh, RNA. So my job was to come in and look to see if this can be verified by fluorescent microscopy, which is so the whole summer I was looking at um, pretty pictures of brain brain places basically. <laughs> And then I also worked on a project um, similar um, by seeing the function of law in um, immortalized mouse embryonic fibroblasts. So we're trying to create a cell line of law deleted um, cells so that they could get a mutated law, this protein, to see if we could insert it back in and find the functional disease um, that were important for the functionality of this protein. Um, so that was kind of my summer project, and um, I'm really grateful to Dr. Ruane um, in particular because I found out about this this um, program through him and his you know, this little chemistry class. So I thought some of my fellow students also might want to know a little bit about the opportunities that you might have um, at the NIH. And so there's this summer internship program, which I was a part of, um, and this is the website where you can just go onto Google and type in um, NIH SIP or summer internship program. And then for recent graduates or people who are about to graduate and you don't know quite what you want to do, this would be a good opportunity for you. Um, it's called a postdoc, so postdoctorate, um, IRTA, so the Intramural Research Training Award. And um, again, this is the website for that. And you spend like two or three years uh, doing research with the intention to go to grad school or a um, professional. This was just a smattering of some of the wonderful uh, senior projects that we do have. Uh, part of the senior research program uh, turned back uh, with our next speaker, Dr. Preston Reed. Dr. Preston Reeves uh, told me when I first got here, he doesn't sign his income tax form as teacher, he signs it as chemist. Uh, he had started a research program back there in his earliest days, and so we kind of got swept up into the summer research program. And so our senior scientist at Texas Lutheran, Dr. Reeves, I'm going to ask Dr. Toledo to give a, uh, those of you that do not know Dr. Reeves, give you kind of a background. He's going to talk about his history of research at Texas. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 2014 PLU Homecoming Celebration. Like I said, it's a special time for me. I really get kind of excited about homecoming. It's just sort of cool. Now we have a homecoming in our own state, and I just can't wait for tomorrow. So hopefully we'll either get your tickets and we have guys. Um, the chemistry department has the privilege today of hosting Dr. Preston Reeves as our, as our homecoming speaker. For a lot of us that know Dr. Reeves, he's a man that truly doesn't need any introduction, you know, like kind of cliche, but it's truly the case. But for uh, some of you that are new here, new generation of students and some of the friends, I want to give you a little bit of the background of what Dr. Reeves has done in his career in chemistry. Uh, Dr. Reeves is truly a friend, a mentor, a person that inspires, he's, he's an all-around person. When I was trying to introduce this seminar to my freshman chemistry class, to try to get him to buy into coming, I said, he's a superstar, and he does it all. Besides being a chemist, Dr. Reeves is a tennis player, an avid runner. 
He is a biker. He likes to bike. He's a photographer. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. So he still works with the TLU tennis team and helps coach Hunt right there and train some of the students down there. He likes to bike approximately 100 miles a week. That's what he puts in his bike. No problem for him. He's run a total of 16 marathons in his lifetime. He's a photographer, a very good photographer. And in his lifetime, the way that he applies that skill is that he travels around the world, but not just to like Canada or Mexico or like, you know, he, says, he doesn't stay local, let's say that. He's visited over 60 countries uh, with his wife Nita and all five continents. So it's just an amazing uh, abilities and amazing set of skills besides the chemist story. So as a chemist, Dr. Reeves uh, got a bachelor's degree at Texas Christian University and got a master's degree from the same school. He then decided to keep loving chemistry like a lot of us did and moved on to get his PhD at UT Austin under Pete Gardner. Pete Gardner at the time then moved to Utah, University of Utah uh, in Salt Lake City as so Dr. Reese followed and did his postdoctoral work there in Utah working on pyrolysis of hydrocarbons. Is that correct? Yeah, pyrolysis of hydrocarbons. After that, Dr. Reese came to Texas Lutheran where he taught for 36 years. He was the organic chemistry in res chemist in residence. He inspired countless generations of students to become PhDs, MDs, he's going to tell us something about that throughout his career here at Texas Group. I never had the privilege to have Dr. Reeves as my instructor, but what I knew of him is that he was an incredible instructor and very challenging for his students, and that he wanted them to do the best that they could be taught. Um, for, um, so in 2001, after 36 years of service, he decided to retire and work from Texas Lutheran, but he's come back and helped us out with some, teaching some classes and inspiring other students by doing some more research around our department. Again, we are privileged to have him speak today, and uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Dr. Preston. Well, some of you recognize the old card. <laughs> we had to for a long time. Uh, you know, organic chemistry is a good game. And I had the privilege of playing that game for many, many, many years. But unfortunately, some of the toys required for that game get pretty expensive, as some of these guys can tell you. But still, it's a fun game. And to play that game, you need a lot of help. So what I would like to begin with is thanking a few people. I won't catch everybody I know. But Texas Lutheran University for their support during those many, many years. The Robert Welch Foundation for those dollars that came in. <laughs> now, a little side note. When I came to Texas Lutheran, of course I've been in graduate school, I was burned out. Research, I don't want to ignore that research. What I want to do is get in there and teach. Well, after a year or two or so, uh, uh, no, you're trained as a chemist. Get in there and do chemistry. So I began to want to do research. And as a graduate student at TCU in Texas, Welch had supported my, my research. I said, well, let's see about Welch. So I contacted him. What's Texas Lutheran? This is not on our list. <laughs> So, the first thing we had to do was to fight through all the paperwork, and I don't recall how this was done, to get approval from the Robert Welsh Foundation to fund research at Texas Lutheran College. We got that, and I managed to get a research grant. And uh, then this continued on for many, many years. I was funded almost every year. And finally, Wells said, nope. And they said, everybody's going to play on the same level now. You're competing with Rice, Texas, A&M, places with eight postdocs, 12, 15 graduate students. Well, that's kind of tough competition. But Wells bailed us out. They started offering departmental grants. And as far as I know, we've had one every year. Isn't that right? We've had these Wells grants departmental grants uh, since T0, since they started those. So Wells Foundation has been very good to Texas Lutheran University with uh, financial support. Also want to thank 
Southern Clay Products, or whatever the name of it is now. I keep changing his name. So B B Y K added. B Y K added. Well, whatever. <laughs> anyway, they get money to support chemistry. So uh, that's greatly appreciated. Also, NSF. Dr. Squires mentioned a little bit the money they gave us. I think it's what, 700000 something like that. So, uh, and there's been some other grants along the way. One of those was brought about through another person that needs some thanks. That's Dr. Ben Shoulders at the University of Texas, who's the guru of NMR at Texas. And he came down and taught an NMR course and helped us when we were applying for a grant to get to NMR. And uh, it worked with Ben's help. So I've known Ben since my days in graduate school. Also, two people who for many, many years were my colleagues, the late Dr. Harold Byer, and this guy sitting right over here, Dr. <laughs> Dave Wasman, who were great colleagues and a great help during my career at Texas Liberty. Now, there are a lot of other people I should thank. I do get some old gray books. <laughs> no, I'm not going to read your grave. <laughs> 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 or Dr. McCluskey. <laughs> How many excuses do I have here, by the way? Well, there's a flock of you. Great, appreciate you coming. Number zero? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I looked through some of those old organic uh, course classes, and I found, and these numbers are certainly approximate, 847 students taking first first semester organic. Now there might be two or three of those that are listed twice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one or two listed three times. <laughs> but of those 847, 89 of those students did research under my direction. I'm proud of those students. Some were Welsh fellows, some were just doing independent studies, whatever. But there are 31 PhDs out of that 89. There are 19 masters, and there are 10 MDs. Now, those numbers are probably low, but you know, undergraduate research is an opportunity to prepare you for graduate school, more so than I think anything else. What if you get in there and don't like it, and then you get in graduate school? Then you've got troubles. You find out that most people do like it, by the way. <laughs> now then, I want to digress a little bit and talk about my career here at Texas Lutheran and the research that I got involved with. <coughs> Like I say, I was kind of burned out when I first came, but then I decided, well, I wanted to do some research. So where do you start? Well, you start with what you've been doing. And back at the University of Texas, I've done some pyrolysis reactions, burned some compounds, <laughs> hydrocarbons, and particularly cyclic halines. Now, cyclic halene, with spring of CH2s over here. Something like this. Well, how do you make cyclic alleys? She should be one of my pinpoint questions. You know, <laughs> what well, what you do, you take an alkene, or cycloalkene, and the one we started with would be uh, cyclooctane because you can get one, two cyclic one of diene, and it'll be somewhat stable. And you treat that with dichlorocarbene. Of course, you've got the rest of your molecule over here. You get this add up, and then you treat that with methyl lithium, and you get the cyclicality. You start with cyclooctane. Now, so we want to make these things, and I'll say a little more about that in a minute. And what we were doing back in those days was the first Welsh grant <coughs> we were 
subsidize the major power <coughs> asset business stuff. But uh, Dr. Gary Strobel is uh, the one who did that most of that work. But this kind of digged along, and this was was tough chemistry. And one of the tough things was this. Now this was back in the 60s. So what we had to do, you generated your dichloral carbene from chloroform. And potassium tbutoxide. Well, how do you make potassium tbutoxide? You didn't go down and buy it at the drugstore then. You don't go buy it from the drugstore with the sigma orange. <laughs> but what we had to do was dry our tbutanol, and I believe we did that by distilling it from uh, calcium hydride. And once we got it kind of dry, we would throw potassium metal in there. When you throw the first potassium metal in, it gets very excited because you're never, never that dry. <laughs> but finally, you can maybe get it settled down enough that it doesn't catch on fire. And uh, you can dissolve potassium metal in there. Then you carefully distill off the excess tbutanol. And then you slurry the tbutoxide in something like pentane. And you put in the dry cyclooctane. And then you dribble in your chloroform dropwise. This takes what? Two or three days? Something like that. So it was a major job. But you can just make it work. Okay. Let's jump ahead now to that sabbatical leave and postdoctoral uh, experience at the University of Utah. Someone in a, probably a group seminar came up with a paper on something called phase transfer catalysis. Now, phase transfer catalysis evolved into what I really spent my whole career working with. There were two really big guns as far as PTC goes. Charlie Starks, Continental Law uh, in Oklahoma, he coined the term phase transfer catalysis. And the other big worker was Mieszysław Kosha in Poland, who he used the term catalytic two-phase reactions for the same thing. And I had the privilege to be to meet both of these gentlemen, get to know them a little bit, wonderful people. Uh, Makosha, uh, especially, I saw him a couple of times. He showed up a poster that I gave in Germany one time, and then he and I were both invited to lecture in uh, Russia, which was really one of the highlights of my career. But uh, Makosha's a neat guy. But anyway, what they were doing, and Makosha is the one that did this work with phase transfer catalysis, was generating dichloroparbene. Now, all of this that we talked about, let's back up. We want to generate dichloroparbene with phase transfer. What did we do? We did an Erlenmeyer class. We set it on a magnetic stirrer. We throw in some 50% sodium hydroxide, and up here we put our alkene, chloroform, and our PTC catalyst. And we stir this like the Dickens for about an hour, an hour and a half, and hey, we get a dichloroparbene add up to our alkene. Now, how many do not know what I'm talking about when I say phase transfer catalysis? Do not know. Everybody knows that? Well, you don't. Okay. <laughs> Let me talk just a little bit about that. Quite often in organic chemistry, you will have a situation in which you're trying to take a salt, which is water soluble, or something that's water soluble, and you're trying to get it to react with an organic material that's organic solid. 
How do you get the two to mix? You know, oil and water don't mix. You get two layers. Well, what you have in phase transfer catalysis, a typical catalyst, no, it's not benzene, we're going to know. <laughs>
that do not require a lot of sophistication to start with. Because you've got to learn that. It's going to take time. Hey, you can throw things in early my class and stir it. It doesn't require too much. And you get some results. <coughs> it's very important to get results. If you're beginning to do research and you work for months and months and months and you don't get anything, what's going to happen if you just start again? You go, ah, I'm in the wrong way. Well, if you get in graduate school, that can't happen, right? But, so you want something that you have a reasonable chance of success when you get started. And you want something that's fairly simple. I was very, very lucky in that PTC offered that opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's really been great to do that. Now, Another really important thing about doing research at a place like Texas Lutheran, you can follow your own bliss. You know, if you said, okay, this seems to work, but I wonder what would happen if, and you take off on a tangent for something that's interesting. You want to do something that's fun, and it may depart completely from what you originally set out to do. Unlike industrial research where you have to have a goal and that goal is profit, in a place like Texas Lutheran, you get a grant, generally you have the freedom to wander around and take it where it may. And that's great fun. You know, so this has been a place for me that's an ideal place to work. Some of the major universities you have to get published or perish, published or perish, get these publications out, write another grant, write a another grant proposal. There was some pressure here, but not much. Most of the pressure here you put on yourself because you felt like, hey, my job is to do chemistry. And that's the way I always felt. I felt that I had three masters while I was here at Texas Lutheran. I had an obligation to the university, I had an obligation to the students, and I had an obligation to chemistry. And you're juggling those all the time. If I was not doing chemistry, I was not doing my job. If I didn't have my office door open when students came by, I wasn't doing my job. I think if I neglected the job, it was to the university. It was a good place to do chemistry. <laughs> uh, I think I put a little more time on the other two. Uh, now, what turns you on in chemistry? To me, it was not the practical aspects. People would say, why are you doing this? You know, what, what do you want to do? Because it's fun and I want to see what happens. I didn't care whether it had any practical significance or not. But if I'm the first one on this little pale blue dot to find out this reacts with this to give this, that's a real ego trip and that's a lot of fun. Now the hard part for me, the hard part of that research was not getting the results and was writing the stuff up and getting it into publication. The writing I thought was very difficult, but that's part of the thing you had to do. Now, what kind of things do I find is fun? If I look back on my career, I think of something Can somebody tell me who synthesized that molecule. Randy Tunnel. Down in Philippi, I believe at the University of Chicago. Cubay. Synthesized in uh, the 60s. And I remember that molecule very vividly because I was taking my qualified exams at the University of Texas. And we got that synthesis as a roadmap to figure out what happened 
and the reference was Philip Eaton to be published. Someone in Texas had gotten the paper for referee and <laughs> put it together as a uh, kid. But uh, some of you might want to look it up. Sits a few bay. It's a fun one. Things like that, you know. What's the value of QBA? Hey, I can make it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the value of it. What about compounds like this? You've got a great big ring and another great big ring put together. Wouldn't that be fun to make? Well, I'll take the make though. Now, one that I always wanted to do, I never did get around to it, goes back to this, not whether it would work or not, I don't know. But, what would happen if we took cyclooctetrine pop that with four moles of dibromocarbene this little buddy. <laughs> and now treat it with a whole jug full of methyl lithium. <laughs> Would it be possible? something that you would start off with a <coughs> beginning undergraduate student to try? Probably not. <laughs> Maybe your second second summer, you know, if things are going well and you had a good food. Oh, by the way, we tried uh, one of those uh, reactions using powdered potassium hydroxide rather than 50 percent. It jumped right out of the flat. <laughs> so uh, some of these things you have to be a little careful with. <laughs> now, these are some of the things that, you know, I think would be fun. If you look at the current literature, and I don't follow the literature real closely anymore, i to admit that. But still, you pick up these little tidbits every once in a while. I uh, saw something the other day. This little molecule has been found in outer space. Something quite different. Uh, there was uh, an article in CNE News. I gave Dr. Bosman these things about uh, the chemistry of wine. And as I understood that, they isolated several compounds from wine, put these together, made a synthetic flavor for wine. Wouldn't that essentially what it got into? Some fairly complex molecules. So that type of thing, uh, you know, does lend itself to, to being fun. There was a website by Halper on phase transfer catalysis. Now, this past week,
this classical reaction had been done using sodium hydride. I'll put the methyl on here. Fifty percent sodium hydroxide. relatively mild conditions. And if you start looking through the literature of phase transfer catalysis, you find a lot of things like this. It simplifies a bunch of chemistry that's very difficult to carry out. Now, you know, questions in chemistry are fun. I want to go to some of the biology people, show some pictures of some flowers. Why are some of those flowers purple, some of them yellow, some of them red? What compounds do you need to get out of there to tell you the colors? Well, a lot of this is known in the literature, but some of it's not. So there's still a big challenge for a lot of you people to, to dig these things out. Now, I have one other little thing, and we'll be through here in just a minute. And this might be a good little problem for, for some of you people in organic. You might want to put this on your next organic test. <laughs> Let's start off with alcohols, four carbons or less, and in organics. Common Synthesis. And we'll put Prestar over there. That's what we're going to synthesize. Jason, I want to ask you the structure of Prestar. <laughs> the little blue pill. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, don't gripe so much when you have to go down and pay so much for pills. Remember, you have to make these things, <laughs> and it's difficult chemistry. Now, uh, that's not all I want to say, except uh, Dr. Toledo did make a couple of mistakes on the introduction. I think it's uh, all seven continents and 18 marathons. Let me say, the reason for that, and I'm serious, in Latin America, they teach you there's only five continents. There's no separation between North and South America. That's what they say. They say, they say, you know how it is. Yes, Paul. Oh, I think you uh, left out a, a significant point in the early uh, <coughs> sarcoidonodiene uh, research that uh, 
you personally discovered, and that was that if you uh, form the uh, cyclopropane using uh, the dibromocarbene and then attempt to uh, purify that product of the intermediate uh, distillation, if you don't monitor the pot temperature, the subsequent explosive decomposition <laughs> leaves a large burnt orange cloud in your lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this actually happened one summer. Uh, I thought I had the distillation going quite well. And this was upstairs for my, next to my office. It was a little research lab. And boom, it goes off. And here, I went charging in there, turned the back pump off real quick. This orange cloud comes drifting down. <laughs> Dr. Prop now had an education class down in 303. <laughs> By the time I got the door open to come out of there, those kids were already filing out. <laughs> they were evacuating in a hurry. But Paul was exactly right. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Toledo. Mark Squire, good pleasure. What a wonderful scientist he was when he not only took my general physiology class for a grade, he took my exercise physiology class for a grade. He was an avid runner, and so he was kind of getting sore in his lower limb, and so he was looking at Runner's World magazine for a compound that was used in racehorses. And it was called DMSO. DMSO. Yeah. And so he didn't believe what the manufacturer was saying. So he bought all the DMSO that he could in different things. And then Mark? Mark Creswell and Dr. Squire and myself. And so I'm back in the laboratory. He goes, what'd you make organic, Dr. Squire? And I said, which time? <laughs> I was one of those guys in the <laughs> there. And so we looked at the purity of the DMSO that was on there. And it was from soup to nuts. It was all, all the same. Yeah. In other words, it's expensive or cheap. <laughs> That's right. Good stuff. And so uh, we published that. Well, lo and behold, uh, last summer, one of our Budweiser fellows was doing an internship with a local cardiologist, uh, David. I was with Dr. Garcia. And they're doing a study on DMSO after angioplastic replacement. Angioplasty is a little stiff. Where they open up the artery, they put a stent in there, and then they would inject DMSO to reduce the inflammatory response uh, in the endothelium. So I took that old article with Dr. Reeves. I said, what's the purity of the DMSO? I you guys are I don't know. I said, it's probably all the same. So don't buy the super expensive stuff. So we might have another little research study, guys. Can we let me look at that? You never know where research or, or scientist, science is going to take you. But uh, science comes from the verb shiri, to know, and it's the subjunctive form of that verb, I want to know. And Preston has been the epitome of that type of scientist. He always wants to know about stuff. So, a distinguished scientist the text of Lutheran, welcome to Homecoming. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.